二零一九年全美中文大会现在开幕。Welcome to the 2019 National Chinese Language Conference. From Mission Bay High School here in San Diego, please welcome Leah Markworth. 掌声有请来自圣地亚哥米逊湾高中学生马惠梅为我们带来精彩的表演。Hello, everyone. I was here in 2014 at Los Angeles for NCLC, and I'm so happy to be back. 这是我在洛杉矶的 NCLC 表演，我非常高兴能回来。大家好。我叫马惠美，我是圣地亚哥州立大学孔子学院的学生，毕业于孔子课堂和晋国际小学和太平洋海滨中学，现在在米逊湾高中读九年级。我是中美友谊的宠儿，从一年级开始我就沉浸在中文环境中学习，因为这些年学习汉语和参加孔子学院的活动，我结交了许多中国朋友，体验到博大精深的中华文化。我今天要表演的节目是京剧。贵妃醉酒，请欣赏。With that, I would like us to focus the next hour or so on pathways and trends to global education, to focus on such areas as student mobility, expanding educational opportunity, and global citizenship. And I have a remarkable panel to share with you. And let me invite them up now: Rajika, Rajika Bandari, the senior advisor. Of research and strategy from IIE, please come up. 
A familiar face to you now, Tony Jackson, our Vice President for Education, Asia Society, and as Tony mentioned, the Director for the Center of Global Education. And next, but not least, Linda Liu, Vice President for International College Board, who oversees our work in over 180 different countries throughout the world. Linda. And before I start this panel, I want you to know I have the honor of moderating this panel. But the organization of such a panel, the organization of such a conference, as Dr. Jackson pointed out, is really the wonderful staff of our organizations. And I would like to take this moment to thank Robert Davis, our executive director, and the, his staff who helped put this conference together, and more importantly, prepared me so well to moderate this panel. So thank you very much. All right, we have 49 minutes and 57 seconds left, <laughs> right? So we need to make this uh, extremely meaningful. And of course, I love this topic of global trends and pathways, because it suggests to us that we all have the responsibility and the opportunity to create pathways to give today's student true opportunity to grow globally. But I want to start by connecting you as panelists to this incredible audience. And I would love to know, if you could just share with the group, that moment when you became in your own mind, a global citizen. What was it that brought you to this point that brings you to this stage? Then we'll move into the meatier content of uh, your work. So if I may, Rajika, what, what brought you here? Absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much to um, the Asia Society and the College Board for inviting me here. And um, I guess I'll, I'll tackle that in two parts. So the first is um, my own journey, which was as um, a foreign student or international student from India to the US um, as a graduate student in psychology um, many, many years ago. And I'm not, I'm not going to date the names <laughs> myself. Um, but it um, really set the foundation for me in thinking about education issues in a global sense. And in many ways, um, it's very interesting, but in the work that I do now, and we're going to talk about it later, um, it's ver been very much, the experience of an international student has been a very lived experience for me. Um, but also, it not only taught me about n a new culture, but also being away from my home country enabled me to reflect on um, both some of the uh, um, the advantages as well as disadvantages of uh, the schooling system in India and actually realizing that I'd, I'd grown up with a um, very global curriculum, at least at the secondary level. <coughs> the other piece I wanted to add to this, as you mentioned, pathways, is that I'm now a parent of a nine-year-old, so I'm constantly thinking about this issue of how do we help children and students and future citizens be global. And with this group in particular, I wanted to share that one of my daughter's earliest international experiences was going to Beijing at the age of five. And she absolutely loved it. And she's forgotten most of the things about her life when she was five, but that experience was very profound for her. And she remembers a moment standing on the Great Wall and many other things where in the years to come, it actually inspired her to focus her class projects on China and just to try and learn more about this country um, with which she was really fascinated. The one thing I will say, and again with relevance to languages, she wanted to learn Mandarin after we came back from China, but our particular school district in Westchester County outside of New York City does not actually have foreign languages at the elementary level. So. So we must follow up with getting a guest teacher Indeed. there is the, is, is the bottom line Indeed. here, which, yes. which could make a difference in, Absolutely. in her life. Yeah. Tony, let me turn sure. to you. What was that light bulb moment or experience? Well, mine was a little bit different. Um, I, uh, I, it, it has to do with taking a journey, um, but 
In my instance, this was a journey from one part of town to another. I was uh, in a voluntary busing program. I'm at the same age as Jim, proud to say. Um, <laughs> And uh, this was back in the late 60s, or early 70s, and I went uh, on a voluntary busing program from my predominantly African-American community uh, in LA to the west side of town, which is predominantly um, white. And this is a situation where um, it was the first opportunity I had ever had to, in effect, sort of do some border crossing. Um, and it could have been a, the case where it could have been fraught with tension, because in those times as now, the um, level of, of sort of understanding between cultures is not as it, as it should be. But it was, a, it, it was in the school that we went to that happened to be um, kind of an experimental school within the larger middle school and high school that um, the teachers there were dedicated to sort of creating an environment to have um, authentic and safe conversations about some of these issues that, you know, came to the fore as these cultures began to mix. Um, and so we had conversations about what we now talk about as white privilege or black rage. And it was in the context of sort of really talking about who we were as individuals and how our cultures um, shaped us, but then being able to take perspective on what other people, the way other people think about things, um, and to see from their, their perspective, we began to develop a kind of hybrid personality and, and really began to in, uh, inculcate some of the, 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 the culture that we were coming into, into our own lives. And so without losing ourselves um, in a different culture, we began to experience that culture and learn from it. And so that was my experience of becoming, in effect, a global citizen within a local community. Um, and it really has shaped my view of both what's possible when cultures are able to communicate deeply with each other, and also, quite frankly, the extraordinary role of education in developing people as both um, you know, human beings but also in terms of their achievement and their opportunities going forward. So that was my experience, really, that led me to be kind of the global citizen that I hope I am now. Great. And before I turn to Linda, what I'm hoping is that each of you is sort of thinking back to your own moment of becoming that global citizen. So Linda, share with us your pathway. So I think my, my moment was in, uh, was in sixth grade. Um, Mrs. McIntyre, probably the, the hardest teacher that I have ever had. She never smiled at anybody. Um, I still to this day cannot remember a time when I, th when I saw her smile. Um, but probably one of the best teachers that I have ever had. And I think that, that really defining moment uh, for me, I, you know, as I saw, uh, Rajika talked about her daughter and what you remember in your memory. I don't remember you know, learning about world history or learning about uh, you know, world geography until sixth grade, until Mrs. McIntyre's uh, class. And you know, just a little bit of background on me. Uh, I came from China to this country with my parents when, when I was six years old. Uh, my family was probably one of two Chinese families in a uh, predominantly white community in, uh, in New Jersey. And so growing up, there was this great sense that um, you know, I want to be like everybody else. I, I don't actually want to you know, uh, pay homage to, to, my, to my Chinese heritage. I really just wanted to fit in with everybody else. Um, and so there was this sense that you know, I should know more about the US and, and uh, the US history and, and what's going on here, world history, you know, my own, my own uh, cultural background, really not so important. But I think it was, it was in sixth grade in Mrs. McIntyre's class when we started to learn more about the world, and in particular, when we started to learn about world geography, that I, re I really understood that the world is much bigger than um, where, where we lived here in New Jersey, in, um, in the US, and that I, myself, because of my own uh, background, had a lot to, to contribute. And that moment was when we were doing a, um, I guess I'll call it a geography bee, and everybody in the class was challenged to write the hardest question that you could possibly think of so that you could stump everybody else in the class. And somebody, somebody wrote a question about, um, you know, what is the capital of North Korea? And, and somebody was probably thinking, like, that is probably the hardest <laughs> question. Who the heck would know the capital of North Korea? Maybe South Korea, but definitely not North Korea. And I don't even know why, but somehow I knew the capital of North Korea was Pyongyang. 
And people were like, we, can't, we didn't even know you could even pronounce that. <laughs> and not only did you just, did you know it? So I think that, you know, at that moment, I really felt like there's something that, um, you know, one could contribute uh, on a more global scale in terms of understanding, you know, that the world around us is much bigger than the borders uh, in which we live. And so I think that was sort of my moment for when I realized that, uh, you know, this global mindset is one that really, really contributes towards uh, who we are as, as hmm. people. That's interesting because from where I sit, I think that was the moment that you were destined to become the vice president for international <laughs> at the college board. I knew, 1950. Yeah, you knew, exactly. But, <laughs> Jim but was already moment. thinking about me back then. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to move forward to the, what I will call you know, the meat of this discussion. But I think what would be helpful to the group would be if we could actually start off by sharing what we hope people will leave with, and then we'll go back and build up to that. So, Looking at our colleagues here, those who are in the classroom, those who are school administrators, those who are leading universities, those who are, as I mentioned, cultural ambassadors. Um, as we think about pathways and trends to global education, what is one big idea you would like everyone here to leave with? And then we'll come back and talk about your day-to-day -day work. So I'm going to say something that's maybe a little bit radical here, given the theme um, and um, topic that we have up here. But I think we will have really moved forward when we'll be at a point where it will no longer be global education, it will just be education. Mm. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that education, and in its most fundamental form, needs to be global. And it's still a, it should not be a situation where we're thinking of education and then we're sort of separately thinking about you know, what are we doing in the space of global education or international education? Because I think global and international is fundamental to a really solid education, solid quality education. So that's number one, that I, I think that um, global really needs to be intrinsic to, um, to education. And sort of related to that is that I think a key takeaway is that that, um, that exposure needs to begin at a really, really early age. And most of my work is at the post-secondary level with colleges and universities. But even in the work that we are doing there around either sending American students abroad or focusing on international students and scholars coming to the US, it is so apparent to me that, that even in the US, that exposure to a global mindset needs to begin very, very early, even when it's not within the framework of formal education. So I think in both sort of the anecdotes that both Linda and I shared regarding our children, that exposure needs to begin really early. So I think that's sort of the, the early exposure part. And then one other key takeaway is sort of this idea of global um, and local, that the global piece is not just about, well, going to another country, and that's what makes it global, but it's about thinking about how those international aspects are really reflected also at home and, um, and locally. Okay, those are three big ideas, <laughs> and we will come back to those as we talk about your work, particularly as it relates to students crossing borders. Tony. Um, I first actually want to comment on what you okay. just said, because I think you're exactly right. The first point you made around um, how what we're talking about here needs to just be the way in which education is done. And I think part of the reason um, that we found in our work that um, the schools that we've, and I'll tell you a little about the work in a minute, but we work in schools where we try to sort of in, in integrate a global focus throughout the entire school and particularly have kids work on uh, you know, solving big global issues as part of the, w the way that which we educate them. And the important piece is there, it, what it does for schools is to create meaning. I mean, you know, we, there's a statistic that says that, um, you know, the, the, the main reason the kids drop out of school is not because it's too hard, it's because it's boring. And I think we have to recognize that and that what global education does is create reason for being there because you're there to think about and learn about and, and really address big global issues that you're facing um, in life. And so I think that is the way in which education engages and really kind of captures the attention of young people and that's the way I think we need to think about education in, in general. Um, but the other takeaway I wanted to mention is um, really building on Dr. Ma's comments about how global education to me is the way in which we address 
the kind of factionalism and um, sort of uh, uh, difficulty we're having in this country and around the world in being able to relate to each other on ethnic and racial and, and religious grounds. Um, I think understanding, again, from a very young age, that there are differences among people, but those differences are assets, um, and beginning to realize that you, know, you can learn so much and you can develop yourself through contact and actually deep understanding of other cultures, that's the antidote to me to prejudice and to racism and to the meism that seems to be prevalent in, in our world so much today. So for me, if we can do that, we've solved, you know, we've solved one of the world's great problems. Great. And that's such an important takeaway for all of us. We'll come back and, and delve deeper into that. Mm -hmm. Linda, what would be a takeaway? Yeah, so, so um, I, I will actually say, say two things. One, uh, you know, I, I, I completely agree with the point that's made about uh, you know, global education becoming just education and these things coming together. And I think, um, you know, as Tony mentioned, sometimes when we sort of look at some of the, the political uh, situations that are taking place around us, uh, for example, just last month, we saw numbers that came out from the Cevis uh, that showed uh, visas uh, being given to students who are international students coming to the U.S. has fallen for two years in a row, and this year it went down 3%. Um, and when we see things like uh, you know, Brexit and, and the rise of nationalism around the world, it's, it's perhaps easy to sort of think that globalization is perhaps coming to an end, but, but I think that's actually far from the truth. I think that um, it's, it's actually going to continue and that is going to be the future. Borders are not going to exist and this sort of brings me to, to my second point which is the power of technology and how that really breaks down borders. Um, you know, each one of us, and, and in particular at this conference, could probably pull out our phones and get right on WeChat. There are no borders there. Um, you know, maybe it's WhatsApp or whatever. But technology has really allowed us to be global. And this, I think, is where, you know, the, the global and the local kind of blend together through technology. But, but I do think that, you know, despite the, um, despite the advances that we might have in technology, um, and in particular for this audience, I do think that one thing that underscores all of that is actually an ability to understand each other. And that actually comes through, uh, through language. So just one story before, before I turn sure. it back to you, Jim. But uh, I just came back from China uh, earlier this week. And uh, you know, I, I speak a little bit of Chinese. I think this audience may have heard me speak a little bit of Chinese, but I am by no means an expert. But I was at the airport trying to check in, um, flying, flying from a small city through Beijing to, to get back home. And uh, I, I went to check in, and obviously they started speaking to me in Chinese. I, I spoke back in Chinese. But then she said something that I just didn't understand what she was saying to me. Um, and I said, C can you speak English? And uh, she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, oh boy. Um, okay, so, so something about my luggage. What am I supposed to do with my luggage? And, um, and so she just kind of stared at me. I'm like, anybody speak English to me about this? <laughs> and she said, no. So she get, takes out her phone, starts typing on her phone, and I'm like, what, what's, what's going on? Like, hello, I need to get to my plane. I need to board. Uh, why are you on your phone? And, and of course, this is a very young lady, and of course, we all know as teachers, like this young generation always on their phone, and I'm like, come on, you have a job to do here. <laughs> Anyways, so, so then uh, two minutes later, she passes her phone to me. In fact, she was typing into her phone to translate what she wanted to say to me, and all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, okay, I gotta pick up my luggage in Beijing, it's not gonna automatically transfer, got it. So to me, that was, um, Technology really, in a, in a technical way, enabled that transaction because I knew what I needed to do. But what I didn't get was the human connection. It, it really kind of left me in a place where like, oh, that was a really, what a hassle and what a, what a, what a not so good experience, even though at the end, I got what I needed. As, but so I think that, you know, being able to communicate in um, language that you know, uh, that, that is mutually under, uh, understandable is really key to human relations and really creating that connection that I think is so important in terms of bringing the world a little bit closer. What I'm hoping is that each of you, again, are thinking about this notion of meaning and how important our collective work is in today's world. And 
you use that word, Tony, meaning mm -hmm. uh, in your description. And what I would like each of you to do is to share your expertise. I mean, each of you are on this stage because you bring an expertise in regard to student mobility or educational opportunity or global citizenship. But I would also be interested on a slightly more personal level, um, the meaning you know, to you in your day-to-day -day work. You're busy people, you give a lot of yourselves, I know that. I'm sure this core of meaning um, allows you to move forward in a different kind of way. So as you're describing your work, and I'm gonna start with you, Linda, so that we don't go in this necessary order, uh, especially in terms of expanding opportunity globally as, as you do. Could you just share some thoughts about your work, why it's important, how it relates to our colleagues here, and the meaning that it brings to you uh, as a professional? Yeah, so my work, uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, I manage all of the college board's work outside of, uh, of the United States. That's 180 different countries. I don't travel to 180 different countries every year, but some days it feels like you know my mind has to wander through 180 different countries. I think the, the one thing that I find is that you know we, we are much more similar across the globe than we are different. And despite the fact that there are cultural differences, there are language differences, the things that we care about in terms of uh, ensuring that you know, students are best prepared for their future and that they have the skills that they need in order to be able to be successful in, uh, in, in, in this new century, I think are common themes across uh, any country that, that we go to. And so for me, when I see that uh, the work that I do, the programs that we have um, allow students to build the skills that they need for, for the future, to me that, that brings a lot of meaning. And I think one of the things that I, um, you know, at the College Board, we tend to be very, uh, very um, um, data savvy, if you may. We, do, we look at our data very closely to make sure that the work that we're doing actually does have an impact and I think one of the things that have been, you know, since we're at the National Chinese Language Conference, some, one of the things that we've been a little bit concerned about in the last couple of years is, is the learning of world languages uh, because of, of technology and such um, declining? And, and it actually is not. Uh, and when I, when I went to look at uh, participation in AP world languages over the last couple of years, we've actually seen those numbers increase at a very healthy rate. So last year we saw a 6% increase in student participation in um, AP world languages. If we look back two years, since 2016, you probably know why I picked 2016 as the, the year to look back to, uh, we've seen a, a nearly 13% uh, increase across all world languages. And when we look more deeply across those languages, with the exception of Latin, sorry Latin, every language grew in participation. And so I think, you know, um, again, despite but what the political atmosphere might be, on an individual level, uh, I think students continue to want to learn languages, to want to be exposed to the world and, and be curious about uh, going beyond. And I think for me in my work, when I see uh, that we're able to create those opportunities, it really creates a lot of meaning for me. I think the 6% increase is really important for all of us to know when people raise this issue about students perhaps not participating as much as they have in the past, I think having that stat is very important for all of us as it relates to uh, the study of other languages. Of course, I was sitting here also thinking, being a data person, I wonder if we are seeing also a 6% increase in resources given to schools related to the study of foreign language. That's something I'm interested in looking into because I think one of the things that we must advocate for, especially as we see increased interest, is making sure that teachers and classrooms and schools have the resources to be able to pursue this important kind of work. And if I may, Jim, sure. on that point, just a little bit of plug for, for AP. In 2019, so starting this fall, we will actually be rolling out new resources to support uh, AP teachers, and of course that includes all the AP world languages as well. Um, 
because, uh, Jim, as you said, it is so important to make sure that teachers are equipped to be able to deliver uh, the courses that they need to in their classrooms. Great. Tony, what does that bring to mind as you hear that information and think about your own work, uh, yeah. particularly uh, in the global competency arena as sure. well as uh, global citizenship? Right. Um, well, before I, I, I say, I just want to make a comment on the technology piece, because you have to be careful about technology. Last time I was in Beijing, I, uh, the waiter did not speak English, and so he had me speak into the phone uh, to translate my order. And unfortunately, I wound up ordering um, a bowl of chicken soap. So I have to be careful. Um, but in our own work, um, I think, the way I think of our work, um, the way we, we sort of uh, develop meaning in our work is, is really in two ways. Uh, one, I sort of think of as thought leadership. Um, we have, I think, been uh, in the vanguard of sort of um, defining and pushing and, 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 and indicating the need for global competence. And so, you know, through publications like Educating for Global Competence, uh, preparing our youth to engage the world, and more recently, um, teaching for global competence in a rapidly changing world that we did, did with OECD, we've tried to make the case for why this is so important. Uh, and to really help um, develop a deeper understanding of why it, it's absolutely essential for education to be global, um, not just as an add-on, but from the sort of core of what it's all about. So, and as well as in, uh, in, in Mandarin language, um, we've done a number of publications, again, trying to make sure that people understand why it's so critical, and, and that particularly that it's, it's not, uh, it's doable. It, it, I mean, the most recent campaign particularly, um, Why Speak Chinese, where we're actually having young people create videos to show you know, their thoughts about why it's so important to develop uh, Chinese language skills. That's the way in which we really want to make sure that there's a groundswell of demand for this. Um, so that thought leadership um, in trying to create the demand and the understanding of the importance, I think, is a really key part of our work. Um, but I would say that the, um, the work that I've been particularly involved in is really kind of on the supply side, if you will. Um, I actually came to Asian Society uh, 16 years ago to start what's called the International Studies Schools Network. And this is a network of, um, over, the, over the course of the last 15 years, we've worked with over 60 schools that have, in one way or another, tried to integrate um, global education uh, in, in their program, kind of in the curriculum and assessment procedures, but also in the whole culture of the school. And so that work in providing um, uh, opportunities for learning, professional development for teachers, opportunities for um, them to come together as, as networks across the country to learn from each other, um, and particularly the fact that um, we have worked primarily in low-income communities of color where we have had to ensure that the work we do to develop global competence is also seamlessly integrated with the work we do to boost achievement. That's been a hugely meaningful um, as, uh, thing to me because we have been able to show that through engaging young people in, 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 in project-based instruction and having them focus on these big global issues, that raises their achievement in science and math and history. And so it isn't anything that's foreign to um, the core curriculum. It is the way in which the core curriculum can be done. And the same thing in, in, our, in our work on the China, China Learning Initiative, where we have, um, you know, we have now a, 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 a network of 100 Confucius um, um, classrooms, each of them uh, connected to 100 schools, or each of them connected to a school in China, so 100 schools all together. That work has really been about creating this community of educators who are um, both advocates for and expert in teaching Chinese language and culture. And um, I, I think uh, it's, it, it's really enormously gratifying to see that um, we've been able to touch maybe 20% of all the kids who are studying Chinese in the country and maybe 18 or so percent of all the teachers. So we, we really believe as though we've had a, a meaningful uh, way of engaging the country in these kinds of uh, learning issues. And so to us, I mean, it really is um, a labor of love because, again, all of us believe that this is the way an education needs to move forward. It is education for all kids, not just some. And it really is a means by which we can elevate the whole field of education to where it needs to go to be a force for, um, for, for making the world a better place. I think the last thing I'll say is in terms of meaning, um, if, you, if you know of our framework around global competence, um, it, the, the sort of fourth element of it um, is taking action. And what we're trying to do is to ensure that young people not only learn well, but they develop a disposition to actually want to be players in the world, not bystanders, to actually take a role in making the world a different place and a better place. And so in the schools that we work in, you'll see that 
the, the after effect of, a, of, a, of a, uh, a project on global warming might be the development of a club where people are going to take that information and, you know, high school students will take it to elementary students and use that information to actually create their own voice and advocacy and their own agency in the world. And that, to me, is the most gratifying aspect of it, when you, when you engage kids to the point where they want to take leadership and go out in the world and make it a better place, because we need them to do that. And so to equip them with that capacity is a hugely meaningful experience for us. Yeah. Both you and Linda have referred to this next generation of student, and I want to come back to that after we talk about your work in mobility and, and students crossing borders. You prepare one of the most re well-read reports internationally on this. I'm sure you do a lot of thinking about it. Share with us some of your work and some of your thinking. Sure. So um, I, I think to begin with, I should say a word about my organization, because that puts in context the specifics of my role and my work. But um, my organization, the Institute of International Education, or IIE, has a 100-year history. Uh, it's a large nonprofit based in the US, headquartered in New York. We have a presence in 19 countries. Um, and in fact, this is our centennial year, so we are celebrating 100th year this year. And it has a very long history since World War I of really keeping the doors of American colleges and universities open to students and scholars from other countries, as well as for Americans to go abroad, especially at times over the past 100 years where, due to political developments, it has seemed that those doors would close down, or as Linda alluded to, borders. Um, so it's played a very cr critical role in really enabling um, flows of knowledge to continue. So with that background, um, my role is really um, ha has been around studying why students and scholars, or why individuals um, are motivated to obtain a global education, why do they travel abroad, where do they go? What drives them? Um, what drives um, institutions and countries to attract them? That's the basic, um, sort of that's the data, and you, you've both talked about data. But in fact, in terms of thinking about meaning, that information and data sits within um, many of the broader debates that we are seeing globally today. It sits and within debates and informs debates around um, global talent flows. How are countries trying to form their global talent pool, both by attracting the talent from other countries, but also sending their own um, students overseas to be trained, as we've seen in the case of both um, Brazil and um, Saudi Arabia. It sits within broader debates about how knowledge economies are being formed what's um, changing demographically around the world um, that's forcing some countries to think about the fact that when their own populations are declining, what do they need to be doing about attracting students from around the world? So it, so it sort of informs those, um, those much bigger issues. Um, the project that, um, that Jim alluded to is, um, is a project called the Open Doors Report on International Educational Exchange that is also supported, that's been run by IIE for, I would say we've been gathering that data for, in some shape or form for almost 100 years, but it's also supported by the US Department of State. And the other sort of meaning making out of this is that while it is the most comprehensive source of data on um, international students and scholars coming to the US as well as American college students going abroad. Um, it, what, what brings me a lot of um, professional satisfaction is that it's really driving a lot of conversations on US campuses today. And in fact, we, we had the president of, um, of San Diego State University at dinner last night and when I spoke to her, I said, I was so pleased to see that on your website, one of the most prominent things you talk about is how well your university ranks in our statistics, in the open door statistics, in terms of how many students are going abroad. So the data is really serving as a critical source of evidence that's enabling over 4,000 campuses in the US to really think about their international strategy, where they're really excelling, uh, whether it's in terms of attracting people from other countries or, or how they're doing in terms of sending their own students abroad. So, so it informs a lot of conversations in the US, but also globally. I mean, related to that, we have another initiative called um, Project Atlas, and I actually want to call out 
um, Madam Yang Shenyu, whom I've known for many, many years, and she's now back in DC, and she was one of the first people in China that I worked with on Project Atlas when, the, uh, when she was at the China Scholarship Council, where we brought together about 25 country partners who represent national level agencies in 25 countries, where we get together to not only share a common understanding of what student flows look like, but it's really sort of driving, again, these broader conversations about um, how well different countries are doing in terms of uh, internationalizing their tertiary level or post-secondary level population. Great. Now, I don't think we can be relevant in our work without fully understanding our students today. And I was sharing with you earlier that I just read a report out of the Chronicle of Higher Education, the new generation of student, Gen Z. Gen Z. And each of you probably have your own thoughts about this new generation of student, but they've been brought up in the era of smartphones. Uh, they depend on technology. Uh, we have been warned at the higher education level that they learn differently, and we're going to have to rethink the way in which we engage students. Any thoughts about Generation Z or the way in which you believe our work must change, if indeed it must change, in order to adapt itself to a new generation of learner? <laughs> you know, I, I do have a lot of exposure to students. Um, I, I, I try to spend a lot of my time visiting classrooms and, and meeting students. And Jim, you know, some of the things that, that you, um, you mention in terms of how engaged they are in the classroom and whether or not they're pulling out their devices and kind of tuning out. Whenever I talk to teachers, they always say, you know, this, this new generation of students, it's, it's completely different. They can't even remember what I taught them yesterday. So, um, I, I, but, but I think that, you know, <laughs> in some ways you could probably think, oh man, like, are, is, is technology um, making us dumber? Uh, it's, it's actually not. What I find is that students actually want to learn in different ways, and students these days are actually much more aware than I think they, that students have ever been. Um, and in, in particular, in my work, uh, you know, we talk about students transitioning from, from secondary into, into college. I find that, um, you know, students are much more aware and much more well-informed about that process and the opportunities that may be available to them. Um, and I think that because, because of the technology that they have access to and the fact that they have access to information at their fingertips, that's what's driving it. But they actually, as Tony said earlier, really do want to engage. I find that this generation of learners, because they are so aware, they're ready to go beyond. They want to have discussions. They don't want to be lectured at. They want to be able to work on innovative projects and feel like they've created something. And so I think, you know, with that context, it is important for, for all of our work to make sure that students have those opportunities and to really honor, um, you know, sort of that style of, of learning that, um, you know, increasingly we're seeing a desire for. We were using earlier the uh, notions of, of boundaries and borders. And one thing about Generation Z, and again, those of you who work with students every day are the real experts here, but the way in which they're captured, this notion of borders, whether it be socioeconomic borders or identity borders, uh, cultural borders, seems so much less important. At the same time, we have this focus on technology I think it's gonna be a very interesting blend as I was trying to think about future trends. You know, on one hand, we have students who are just so much more open in some respects, but yet one could argue so much more focused and closed as a result of technology. Any thoughts? Well, then I, 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 I'll just pick up on one aspect of you said, um, and I think of actually my own daughter who's probably somewhere between Z and whatever the known one before that, X, I guess. <laughs> Z also sounds a bit final. I have to think about that a bit. Um, but, um, but I mean, uh, her her um, her take on um, kind of how you live within a, a multicultural society is 
is very much more fluid than, than her parents' generation. Um, I mean, there is this notion that I think you mentioned of, and, and Veronica Borgs-Mancia, my co-author, um, uh, talks about the notion of sort of hybrid identities and, and people crafting their identity um, based on, and with technology, based on a, a much broader exposure to other cultures, other ways of thinking. And so I think um, to a certain extent, I mean, I, I do advocate that that we take a very intentional um, uh, approach towards making sure that young people have the opportunity to have experiences in engaging with other cultures. On the other hand, I also want to make sure that we don't get in the way. That we just um, allow this process that has sort of organically grown where kids are naturally sort of understanding and thinking in a more global way to flourish and, and not put them in the boxes that sometimes we ourselves are caught in. So, I just think that um, we, there's a lot that we need to teach Generation Z. There's also a lot we need to learn from them in terms of how you actually craft your own identity, how you relate to the world in a much that is, it, 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 you know, I mean, my, my, young, my daughter grew up in Pasadena, California, which is a very diverse culture, and that's just what she's used to. And so how do you make sure that you, in effect, um, sort of encourage their natural tendencies to create relationships um, and not voiced on them the kind of we-they thinking that sometimes characterize our generation. In the few minutes we have left, I want to end this panel on a very practical note. You know, we've talked in big terms. And one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is because I want to remind you of how important our work is. It is relevant. It is important. And on a day-to-day -day level, when we are grading examinations, when we are dealing with students who maybe are not as well prepared as they should, it's easy to forget the bigger picture of why we need to be doing what we are doing. So I want to end on a more practical note. I talked about what big ideas did you want our colleagues to go away with. What is one piece of advice you would give us as a community, you were, used that word, Tony, in your introductory remarks today, this broader community. A piece of advice you would give this group, or a challenge you would give this group, mm -hmm. or a question you would give this group to pursue over the next day and a half as we are together here as a community. And I won't ask in any order, I will just let you share. So, so maybe I'll start. I think. Um, you know, again, Jim, as you said, uh, the the day to day of of being a teacher, uh, preparing your lessons, grading papers. I think um, I would I would love to have this audience. Um, you know, make sure you remember that you are also ambassadors um, for for a global education, for the learning of Chinese, um, and for for this generation of uh, Generation Z students who, um, you know. As, as Tony said earlier, we don't want them to just sort of have like free reign, right? There, there needs to be, uh, you know, I think um, a, a caring adult in their lives who are being are able to advocate for thinking about um, how to make sense of the globalization of, of the world and how education fits into all of that. And so I think, um, you know, I would encourage all of the teachers here to remember that they are ambassadors in the classroom. You're not only there to you know, have them for nine months and teach them Chinese, but that there is a much larger role there. Great. Um, so uh, maybe two thoughts, and since you said something very practical, um, I was reflecting on the point, um, Jim and Linda, that you both made um, about um, the growth in foreign language learning at the secondary level. So while that's true, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that is not what we see at the post-secondary level in the US. And it's been a cause of great concern that over the past few years, um, the number of American students pursuing foreign language study at colleges and universities has actually been declining. So while there's great news at the secondary level, there's clearly a gap here. So I think a big challenge, as you, as you all sit down and talk about these issues over the next couple of days is, is to think about what's the missing link there? And does there, more work need, does there need to be more work done 
to connect with the post-secondary sector to think about why that breakdown is happening. I'll share one reason, perhaps, for why, for why this is really a, a, another sort of side to this dire situation is that I fear that American post-secondary students are also getting a little bit complacent when it comes to foreign language study because many countries but that they're now studying abroad in are actually, and non-English speaking countries, are now beginning to offer a lot of coursework in English, including China. So we have a lot of American students now going to Germany to in fact do full master's degrees, many students interested in going to China, going to other non-English speaking European countries, but they're able to study in English. So that really reduces the push and the incentive for them to really be continuing the foreign language study that they were probably pursuing at the secondary level. So I think that's a real challenge. And I don't know what the answer is, but maybe you all will, will figure that, um, that out. And then the second piece I just wanted to add was, since we were um, talking sort of in the earlier round about um, Generation Z and what, what drives them, um, and to, as you again think about students over the next couple of days is that I think this generation is really different from previous generations of students in that they are very savvy consumers. They are thinking, they and their families are thinking about what's the return on investment to a global education. Why are we investing in this? What are we going to get out of it? In a very deliberate way that I think previous generations didn't necessarily think about it. And they also have many more choices. I don't think previous generations had the sort of choices they have. So to also be thinking about that of sort of the student as a consumer, um, consumer um, uh, framework. Very helpful, thank you. Yeah. Tony? So I, I, a couple things. Um, one, I, I think one of the real trends that I've seen uh, over the last 10, 12 years in global education is going from um, having to convince people it's important to now there being a pretty, I think, deep sense that this kind of education is important. And so the shift has been from why should we do this to how. And so I actually would say to you all as teachers that you are not only ambassadors, but I think you need to be advocates for yourself to have the resources that you need to actually do this work in the best way possible. Um, I mean, it comes down to having the, the professional development and the resources to actually do whatever changes in pedagogy need to happen or to be able to you know, improve the work in, in, in you do with class in schools and with, with students to make sure that you have what you need to do that. I mean, there's a huge need for you as, as teachers to really be in the forefront of, of saying, look, this is the way education has to be done and we need the resources to do that. So I would just um, uh, invite you to be uh, advocates as well as ambassadors for that. Um, and I think, um, uh, uh, I think I've lost the second point. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, I guess the, the other thing I would say as well, I mean, it's sort of a, um, a repeat of what I said before, but I think um, the, the great asset you have around global education is the relevance of it to young people's lives. Um, in my view, the, the way in which, uh, the, the most important issue that's going to keep on coming up over and over and over again is climate change. And that is going to make uh, it apparent that we live in a global interconnected world more than anything else. Um, I sit on a, uh, an advisory board of the National Geographic Society, and you know, they sort of have their, their hands on all the data about kind of what the future is going to look like if we don't change our ways with regard to climate change, and it's not pretty. And so I think, though, it really is an opportunity to engage people, to engage young people in a, in a, in a, in a set of issues that really are fundamental to the, to the future of humanity. And so to imbue them with this notion that they need to be actors and advocates and, and the solutions to these problems, I think, is, is core to what education needs to be about. And so the extent to which you, you can really sort of make sure that they understand and have the capacity to address these issues, it becomes vital. And it also, again, becomes the reason why education makes a difference and why it's important and why people actually want to sit in classrooms and think about this stuff. So I would just say keep it real as much as you can, um, and, and, and use the world as your, 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 your classroom, in effect, um, to, to draw people, young people into this, this role they have of really being the champions for the world we have uh, going forward in the future. You know, that notion of global problems require global solutions, mm -hmm. and everything we have talked about today, 
I think, focuses just on that one point. I was sitting here thinking, how would I answer the question I first asked you, what do you want this group to leave with? I would answer it this way. I want you to leave here after listening to this panel, reminded of the fact that the work you are doing is indeed a big deal. It's a big deal. When I'm around friends who have traveled to China, especially as often as we do, it's easy to sort of take it for granted. I think we can't forget that that international experience does continue to shape the lives of students. And as I was sharing with my colleagues earlier this morning, that light bulb went off for me as I was thinking, how did a first generation kid from San Jose, whose mom was a maid and whose dad was a barber, get to be thinking about China and the world? And I thought it was maybe because of my early trips to Mexico where my parent, my mom immigrated from Mexico, but it was really having that third grade teacher, Miss Hawk, who was an exchange teacher from England. And it just took this conversation we had yesterday and this year's conference to look in the mirror and just think to myself, that was it. We each have that light bulb moment. But let us remember that what we are doing is still a big deal. We are still shaping the lives of students and this next generation Z who will soon be sitting on this stage and in this audience leading the way to education or global education or education, however we define it. Thank you so much, panelists, and thank you for being so